Well, go ahead and take your Bibles, if you would. Open to John chapter 19. We'll get there in a moment and give you a specific set of verses to look at. I want to welcome in all of our campuses and different venues. I want to say to our live streaming venue upstairs, especially thank you for being willing as small groups to kind of rotate out there, up there, excuse me. Uh, it's functionally full in here this morning, and so what you're doing is paying off, and it's opening seats for our community. So thank you, and thank you for just having the community in mind as we think about how we're growing and what God's doing in our midst. As we prepare for John 19, let me just provide for you a, 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 an illustration coupled with a story, maybe a question. Have you ever received a gift that when you opened it, you liked it, but then the more you looked at it, the more you experienced it, it may have been either you know, a few hours or maybe days or maybe even months, but as you um, saw all that it brought to the table, all the ways you could use it, you liked it even more. In other words, your thought was like, man, I had no idea this was this good. It was way more of this than I thought. Maybe you have a gift like that in mind. I, I have one. Julie last Christmas gave me a wallet. It seemed like a pretty normal standard gift. Now, I don't carry wallets with me. I have a wallet. I keep it near me. But I don't like anything in my pockets normally. And so um, I was a little bit like, oh, I got a wallet. And she's sending me a message that I should carry a wallet on me. But she wasn't. She goes, I just thought you might like a new wallet. I usually keep it in my backpack or something. And so I, th I said, thanks. I looked into it. Had a couple of features that I thought at least in this were pretty cool for what a wallet can do, right? It did more than just like have a few bills in it, right? Well, I noticed the next week or two that it also had some kind of air tag kind of functionality. And then just two weeks ago, I was in line and I was trying to get my license out. And I was struggling to get my license out. And Julie leans over and she goes, just press in that little hole with your finger. And I did, and the license slid right out. I mean, everything's better when Julie's around. That's how I see it, right? <laughs> and she looked at me and grinned, and I just thought, I'm, I like this wallet a ton. I didn't know all that when I first got it, but the more I use it, the more I like it. I think this is true for parenting, the gift of parenting. You know, children are a treasure, right? Yeah. So parenting's a gift. It's hard. It's difficult. But it's a gift, and I, I've learned something as I've grown older. I appreciate my parents even more as my kids get older. Now, I, I appreciated them a whole lot when, I had, when our kids were little. Could every parent here say amen? Because you realize, like, oh, this is what you went through. And you, you just have a lot of gratitude towards your parents. But I've found that to increase. As our kids have reached certain stages, now they're all gone, they're married, and and I've looked in a whole new perspective at my parents, at things that I didn't know till my kids were gone that they went through when I left. I mean, just the whole range of emotion and my appreciation for parenting has really increased. It's like I, I didn't know it was this much, it was so deep when I first started. Does that make sense? It's, it's the same idea of like you open something up, but when you experience more of it, you grow to love it more. So I want us to do that today, spiritually speaking, scripturally, with the gift of the atonement. Say the word with me, atonement. Kind of a theological word, it's only used once in the Bible, but the concept is all through scripture. It simply means covering, most specifically for our sins, it can mean forgiveness, taking away. There's a, a broad range, but the technical word to describe what Jesus did on the cross, what we're going to celebrate and remember on Good Friday is the atonement. And it's described quite pointedly in John 19 verses 28 to 30. Let's look at that for a few moments, can we? And let's initially open this gift of the atonement. As you're putting your eyes and a finger on those three verses, let me say to you that this morning will be a message mainly aimed at the church. If you are a guest, if you're a visitor, if you're a seeker 
maybe an agnostic, or maybe you kind of stepped in to kind of find out what Christianity is all about. I'm so glad you're here. That's fantastic. Just be aware that I'm probably aiming most of my um, conversation to our church, believers in this faith family. So you'll hear me say some things with some assumptions this morning about what we believe and the cross of Christ. And so just be aware of that. I will make some application toward the end to all of us. But on this special day that begins passionately, I felt a pastoral responsibility to bring some um, heightened awareness of this crucial doctrine that we believe, the doctrine of the atonement. It's also a personal blessing. Amen. The atonement, Christ covering our sins once and for all. And so it's just a very important element of our faith. I'm going to talk to our church family pretty extensively this morning, but I'm glad you're here and I hope that this will be an encouragement to you as as you kind of listen in. The atonement's referenced very directly in John chapter 19. Three verses, 28 to 30. Let's read them together. Follow along with me. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, just underline those four words, would you? That the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Underline those three words, would you? And then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This is John's recording of the final words of Jesus from the cross. All the other gospels give us insight into what occurred in these moments. Uh, Traditionally, we believe Jesus said about seven things from the cross. These are the last two. John seems to say the last one were the words, it is finished. But another gospel shows us that actually after this, he then said, I commend um, to you my spirit. So there were several things he said, but these are at least the last and next to last things Jesus said from the cross, his earthly life. I had you underline some words. Notice in verse 30, first of all, the words, it is finished. I do underline those. Now, in the original language, that's one word. And you've seen this word on T-shirts. You've seen it um, on billboards. You've probably seen it on your social media feeds. It's tetelestai. I don't normally say the Greek words, but you've seen that word around. It's not an uncommon word. And it simply is the one Greek word for our three English words. It is finished. But what we often don't ask ourselves is, what is it? Like We love that word, don't we, as Christians? It's finished. And we should rightly love that word. But have you ever asked yourself, what is it? Well, let's ask ourselves this question. What did Jesus know about the it? Because he said it in two letters, at least in the English language, right? It. He's, he knows it refers to something. Notice what it refers to in verse 28. Everything was now finished. Now, would you agree with me that everything seems larger than it? Would you agree with that? I think the average person says, oh yeah, everything. And in the original, that's two words, all things. So it's plural. So Jesus knew. That's a mental understanding. So in verse 28, Jesus mentally knew all things were finished. And in verse 30, Jesus verbally said, it is finished. Same word, finished, by the way. It means complete, accomplished, done. It's the idea of executing something all the way through. Um, It has the idea financially of something being paid in full. So the idea is that there's nothing left to be done. We're not involving ourselves in something unfinished. Twice, something is said here to be finished. Everything in it, and what those words point to are the atonement. But the reason it's said as everything and it is because the atonement is such a beautiful gift that we can unpack various facets and aspects of it for days. I'd remind you, this is a doctrine It's also a personal blessing. It's historical reality. So this is a large word. And Jesus knew a lot about what was happening. And he said it very plainly and simply. 
It's that that I want to look into. I want to look into the everything and the it for a bit with you this morning that was finished, completed, brought to an end, fulfilled, okay? And I want to show you five things about this gift of the atonement, five things about the everything and the it that I think will cause your heart to beat faster and faster and to rejoice in the Lord. Let's go to the first one, can we? When Jesus said it is finished, I think first of all, he was saying, and this is the most obvious, that physically the crucifixion was finished. Now crucifixion is a word to describe the, the um, way that Jesus died. He was crucified. It's a physical act. It's a Roman death sentence. And so if you were to do an autopsy on the body of Jesus after he died, you would find that from a medical point of view, from a, a, a death perspective, Jesus died of suffocation. Now we know it's far bigger than that. He gave his life. He willingly laid down his life. He didn't die until he knew it was finished, correct? So he didn't suffocate like, oh, I'm not trying to die right now. He knew exactly what was up and he gave his life at the exact moment he knew it was finished. But I'm just saying physically, as a human man, which he was, fully God, fully man, in a body, he was hung on a cross, hands and feet nailed, and he hung there, and he died physically. And when he said it's finished, he did mean at the least that the physical act of crucifixion was over. They may be wondering, like, why did that have to happen? Because it seems like there would be a better way. Like, why couldn't God just kind of wave a heavenly wand over everything and like, whoosh, forgiven. We can avoid all the torture, the lashings, the nails, the crown of thorns. But here's why it had to be a physical body because, and I'll explain more in a moment. Um, for centuries, there was a physical sacrifice made for the atonement of Israel's or God's people's sins every year. A lamb was brought. And so Jesus now is here, and he's bringing a physical offering. But guess what that offering is? It's his body. And there must be an offering if there's to be a sacrifice. You can't walk up with a pretend offering. And so Jesus, as our high priest, actually brought an offering. His offering was his body. This is why he said at the Lord's Supper there to his disciples, he said, this is my body. He had bread, he broke it, he split it in two to eat it with him. But he was saying, what you're going to see happen is my body will actually be the final sacrifice on this day of atonement. And that's the second point, is at the cross, the atonement means that spiritually the final sacrifice was finished. So these really go together. There's a physical nature of the atonement in which the crucifixion occurred, but when what Christ was offering was more than his body. It was that for sure. But his body was the spiritual sacrifice that atoned for the sins of God's people forever. You see, before this, it had to be every year. The Day of Atonement, Good Friday as we know it, 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 it happened every year. And what they would do is this. The high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. He would sprinkle blood from a lamb or a goat or a calf or some type of animal that was perfect without blemish, without spot. But the lamb still wasn't divine. The animal wasn't divine. It was set apart and sanctified, but it was still, can I use the word uh, earthly? I almost said human, but that's not true. But it was earth. It was the best we could offer. And that's exactly why it only lasted a year. So a year passes, the sins of the people have piled high. Okay, let's find another animal. And this went on for centuries, every day of atonement. But Jesus came, and when John saw him as he began his ministry, he said in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And so when Jesus approached Calvary and gave his life on the cross, he gave his life, yes, physically as an offering, but he gave it spiritually as the final sacrifice. And here's why Jesus' sacrifice of his body, the Lamb of God, 
lasts forever because Jesus is divine. He's holy. So when he gave his life and shed his blood, it lasts forever. It satisfies God forever. This is why our redemption, our atonement is called an eternal redemption in the book of Hebrews. Peter would say it like this, and I'll mention several verses. You ought to write them down just so you'll have them for your small group discussion, maybe with your family. Uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. You see those physical markers there? There's an actual time and space where a body was on a tree, but he also says in chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, that we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So Peter connects. It's a physical reality with spiritual realities. It's the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus giving his life as our high priest, a physical body, but because his body is divine. He's earthly, he's heavenly, he's fully God, fully man, and God sees the sacrifice of Jesus of himself and accepts that blood and that life as atonement forever. Amen. This is why Hebrews chapter 9, I'd encourage you to read Hebrews 9 and 10 a lot this week. You find multiple times it talks about that Jesus appeared at the end of the ages once and for all to obtain eternal, eternal redemption. He gave his life at a one point in time forever. So Jesus' sacrifice of his physical body is the sacrifice that ended all sacrifices. Hallelujah, church. Amen? Amen. That's what's in the atonement. It's the physical body of our Lord and Savior being offered by our Lord and Savior that satisfies God forever. I don't know if you're like me, but I feel like a big old weight just fell off my back. Smiles on my face that for those who believe in Jesus, I don't have to impress him, pacify him. I just plead the blood of Jesus. Amen, church. It's such a comfort what Jesus has done for us. Thirdly, notice this aspect, this facet of this beautiful gift of the atonement. There is a um, prophetic nature to it. And I think we can tend to overlook this but there's a lot of richness in this. Notice in the text, Jesus says in verse 28, when he knew mentally everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So on the cross, in all of his pain, he was mentally aware that lots of things were being finished and they were being finished as fulfillment of the Old Testament. In fact, can I show you something pretty interesting that maybe you weren't aware of? I held this off till now. I hope it textually jars you in a good way. Do you see the word fulfilled in verse 28? It's actually from the same root word as what the word finished in verse 28 and the word finished in verse 30 is from. You could technically say that the scripture might be finished. Three times in this set of verses, Jesus is aware that something is being completed. When it comes to the prophecies made about him, there are about 300 or so of them. Now, not all of them are about his death, okay? Some are about his coming. Some are about his resurrection. Some are about his second coming. But there are some about his death. And let me say this to you clearly and plainly. Every prophecy about Christ's death when he said it is finished, was fulfilled. Every one of them. In other words, Jesus proved to be the Christ, which is our English way of saying the Messiah, the long way to one. In his death, Jesus proved to be the one sent from God as our Savior. Amen. Can I just read for you one of the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus? You could go to Genesis 3 in which we're told that he will crush the serpent even though the serpent will wound him. That's a really interesting prophecy about his death. But I like the one in Psalm 22. Just You can turn there, but you can just hear this as well. A few verses in Psalm 22. It's a messianic psalm. What I'm about to read to you, from what we know historically, never happened to David. David's the author of the psalm. It never happened to David. And yet he writes it in the sense that it is or that it did or that it may 
But the truth is God inspired him, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this pointing to Jesus. Listen to how hundreds of years before Christ, David writes this and how accurate it portrays the crucifixion, the atonement, the cross. This is verse 13. I'll just read certain phrases through verse 18. They opened their mouths against me, lions mauling and roaring. I am poured out like water. My bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. Do you hear suffocating words in there? My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Remember, he was thirsty. Dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves. They cast lots for my clothing. Hundreds of years before Christ died on the cross, David writes this as a prophetic psalm about what Jesus would endure. And Jesus did endure that, exactly that. And so when you think about the cross, understand this. It's a beautiful picture of prophecies being fulfilled. And especially the ones about his death, they were completed. Jesus is the Messiah Amen. who came to die Amen. for the sins of the whole world. Notice fourthly, the atonement has a judicial aspect. In other words, there's a, and you could put the word financially here, but the problem is that I like judicially better because it has the sense of something that I owe a judge. And so we uh, will meet our maker, God, who will judge all people, the Bible says. And because we're unholy and have sinned against God, if we stand before God, our maker, our judge, without a lawyer, without someone to advocate for us, that's not a good day. Here's why. There's nothing you can do to convince God your judge to declare you innocent or righteous or to use the most theologically correct term, holy. See, there's, there's the real difference. We're unholy. We're not just tainted by sin. The Bible says we're born in sin. Right. We're sin from the get-go. Right. God has never known sin. He's holy. The word holy means set apart. It means otherworldly. He's completely different than us. And we've broken his commands, violated his law, abused his love. And there's this gap now, this eternal canyon, this, this incredible distance that, that I can't bridge. No matter how hard I try, no matter why, what I do, anything I do is going to come up short because it's not holy. Even my best efforts have a threat of corruption because I'm human. I was born in sin. God's holy. So, so I have this eternal dilemma. How do I reconcile with my maker, with my God, with my judge. Well, this is where Jesus steps in and he bridges the gap because he is fully God and fully man. Paul told Timothy, there's one um, God and there's one man and there's one mediator between God and man. It's the man, Christ Jesus. And so because Jesus is holy, he's God, and because he's human, he stands between God and man and he's the bridge. That's the way we access God. We get to God. We're declared innocent. We're declared righteous. Watch this. We're declared holy because God sees us through Jesus. Yeah. So anyone who believes in Jesus, that he lived, died, and rose again, that he's the only way to God, Jesus dresses them in his righteousness, his holiness. So when God looks at Scott Helms, he doesn't see Scott Helms. The human. Now watch this. He sees Scott Helms, the saint. Say, why did you use saint? Because saint literally means holy one. Scott Helms, the holy one. That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? <laughs> but I could say it about any believer in this room. When God sees you, he sees you, Mike Baldwin, the saint. He's actually not seeing Mike or Scott or Todd or Jordan or Ollie. He's seeing Jesus. 
And you're in Jesus. You're in Christ. And so you're a holy one. You're a saint. Is, is the atonement beautiful or what? This is what happened judicially. And so when God sees Jesus, he sees his death, his payment for sin, it lasts forever. It's eternal redemption. He stamps on your record, paid in full. Good to go. You're clear, clean. You don't owe me anything. And you didn't do anything. You just believe. This is why I say to you, the verse that says we are more than conquerors through him that loved us is a sweet, sweet verse. Because if you ever ask yourself, what's more than a conqueror? I'll be frank with you. I'll take the title conqueror any day. Wouldn't you? Like, that's a pretty good term. Like, hey, Edgar, he's a conqueror. Like, you don't get much better than that, right? But the verse says, we're more than conquerors. You ever ask yourself, what is more than a conqueror? Here's the answer, an heir. Because here's why, and let this just uh, you know, wash over you. An heir gets all the benefits and none of the work. So if you're in Jesus, Jesus is the conqueror. He did all the work. But if you're in Christ, God looks at you and he says, you get all the benefits. So you know what's more than a conqueror? An heir. And that's what Paul says we are in Christ Jesus. More than a conqueror. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. All because of the atonement. A lot happened when Jesus died. Amen. And you've opened the gift and you've thought, oh, Good Friday's coming. He died for me. I believe that. But there is so much more to it. And as we look at it, unpack it, I just hope that it just continues to wash over us today, tomorrow, especially this week as we approach Good Friday, the beautiful gift, the increasingly valuable gift of the atonement. One more I want to show you, which is probably my favorite. It flows out of this judicial understanding as well. As that's the relational concept. So let's walk through them briefly. Physically, the crucifixion was over. Spiritually, the sacrifices were over. Prophetically, the prophecies were finished or fulfilled or over about his death. Judicially, the debt was finished. I mean, we're answering the question, what is it? What is the everything? It's these things right here. Our debt, those prophecies, um, the, the gap, crucifixion. And this last one here, the relationally means that, that our separation is finished or our distance. Remember the, the eternal dilemma that we're in? Because we're unholy, God is holy. It was Jesus that brought us together. Now, historically, in time and space, this is in the most technical understanding what occurred in the three hours when things went dark. So he was on the cross after his mock trials, beatings, and they nailed him, they hung him up probably about nine in the morning. Somewhere around noon, it goes dark. And it stays dark until 3 p.m. During those three hours, I believe, theologically and historically, what happened was Jesus endured our separation for us. This is why he would call out from the cross these words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, without Jesus, you'd be left to pay for your sin, for your unholiness to God, yourself. Now, here, let me just kind of lay this out to you. That never gets done. That's an infinity problem. Because if you're unholy and God is holy, and you're left to pay for your, separ your, your sins, and that payment is separation from God, you don't ever fill that up. You don't say, you know, I've been separated for a million years. Is that enough? Unholiness can never assuage the wrath of a holy God in a million eternities, lifetimes. You can name whatever number you want that's incalculable. We'll never reach it. I hope this is staggering to you. Without Jesus, we will infinitely have to pay for our sins, which means we'll be forever, eternally separated from God with no hope. 
We can't bridge the gap on our own. We can't cross this divide. We inherently don't have what it takes. But Jesus did. And here's what is so astounding to me. He did in three hours for all who believe what we can never do in infinities. And that's not because that was an easy load to bear. It shows the magnificent strength of our Savior. I don't know if we'll ever fully understand all that's in the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's such um, theological intricacies in there that I just love to dig. I don't quite get it all. Jesus is God. How does he cry that about God the Father and God the Son, and yet he's human? I mean, we could get into all kind of wonderful debates that are delightful in one sense. Just know this. Somewhere in the heavenly realm, all the separation that you and I should know from God because of our sin, Jesus took every second of it. And so now, to all who believe, God says, welcome home, come near, come close. You're not an enemy, you're a family, you're not out, you're in. This is why Ephesians 2.13 says that by his blood, he has brought near those who were far away. Amen. Is your heart not rejoicing? Yeah. That when Jesus said it is finished, he was saying the separation is over. Yes. Now catch this. We can hear say amen and rejoice in that. But there was something that happened in that moment physically and historically to represent and symbolize that. In the temple, where the high priest would often go and sprinkle blood on things, there was a pretty thick curtain that separated that area from the other areas. No one could even go past that curtain but the high priest. And even then, he had to be fully clean, sanctified, a big ritual. And they would often tie things to his ankles. So if he sinned in there, they could drag him out. I mean, very important place. It was the place where the mercy seat was, the dwelling of God. When that curtain was ripped from top to bottom, it was the symbolic representative act that we who believe have access to God. That happened in literal time and space in the temple. There was an earthquake at three o'clock. This curtain is ripped and the message is clear. Jesus has paid it once and for all. Believe and come into my presence. So, so, so many things happened at the atonement, didn't it? Here's five of them. Physically, the crucifixion was finished when he said it is finished. Spiritually, when he said it's finished, the sacrifices were finished. Prophetically, when he said it is finished, the prophecies about his death were fulfilled or finished. Judicially, when he said it's finished, our debt was finished. And relationally, when he said it's finished, our distance was finished. The separation was finished. This reminds me of that old wallet Julie gave me. I liked it when I first saw it, but I like it a lot more every week, right? You just keep looking, you keep looking, you keep digging, you find things like, hey, this does that, this does that. And there's so many beautiful aspects to the atonement. I hope they'll wash over your heart. You'll just be prepped for Friday like never before. All these aspects in the plainest of language say one word to us. Forgiveness. Thank you, That's the uh, vernacular of the common man when it comes to the atonement. We can talk about these five aspects and many more. We can dig into so many scriptures. I wish I could have just read so many more to you. But here's the plain language for the common man or woman. You can be forgiven. Because of Christ, believe on him and experience forgiveness, cleansing. This is why I like Psalm 32. While you think about this word forgiveness, hear this verse for the common man. David writes this, Psalm 32. How happy is the one whose sins are forgiven. Like, I like that verse, don't you? I mean, it's just... 
straight to the point and it doesn't disguise the fact that I've got happiness and joy, not because of where I work, what I drive, a raise I got, a relationship, my March Madness bracket. Like you can pick any type of earthly human thing that at times we can have fun with them, their hobbies, whatever. They're not, they're not always sinful. They could be, but they're not always. But here's what David says. None of those bring happiness. Here's what brings me happiness. I mean, that, that I'm forgiven. That God does not impute iniquity to my account. And why can David say that? Why can we say that? Because of the work of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice for all who believe. Thank God for the atonement and the forgiveness it brings. Yes, thank you, Lord. So let's answer the question. What is the final word of the cross? Here's our passion week truth number one. The final word of the cross means a forgiven life. Jesus paid your debt. Jesus closed your gap. Jesus finished your sacrifices. He took your place. Jesus did everything so that you could be forgiven. And this morning, if you are a believer, you've trusted in Christ, you've taken your stand on the gospel, this is the word that most succinctly describes your life in light of the atonement. Forgiven. Free. Clear. Close. In. All because of Jesus. Amen, church. So can we do this together as we wrap up this morning? Can we just metaphorically take the gift of the atonement? And can you, I hate to use the word pretend, but can you imagine with me that you're opening this gift? You have it. It's your gift. You've received it from God. You're a believer. But you're going to gaze at it more now. You're going to take these five areas, you're going to unpack them, you're going to dwell on them, ponder them, and you're going to make sure that this gift means more to you this week than you ever thought it could. You're going to just bask in the beauty of this gift, dwell on its sufficiency. Can we do that for a while? Let's start right now, can we? So all of our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Can we just draw a circle around each chair? And as the band joins me, I just want to invite you to start pondering and gazing upon this gift of the atonement. All believers in the room, meditate upon it. Consider its depth, its width. Perhaps rehearse those five aspects. Maybe one of them really spoke to you and you're going to Kind of drill down in that. and that. Can you do, all of us to do this now, all believers in the room, as you've drawn that circle around your seat, you had this sanctuary place and you're, you're contemplating the atonement and this gift that you've been given. You're seeing it just unfold and be unpacked and, and you just are so grateful. Can you just ask the Holy Spirit in this moment? The Holy Spirit of God. Widen my understanding, illuminate my eyes, deepen my love. Use other words like that, but would you ask the Holy Spirit of God to in this moment increase your spiritual understanding into Christ's sacrifice for you through his word? Our text in John 19, other corollary verses ones that will be on the reading plan for this week. We'll get that when you leave. Would you right now ask the Holy Spirit of God to illuminate your mind to his word, to the person of Jesus, so that you see in greater detail the depths of the atonement he provided for us, the covering for our sins, the payment of our debt.
Now, while that's occurring, and across this room, from my left to my right, I suspect there's a host of people who right now, your appreciation is deepening. It's probably morphing into amazement. There's a lot happening in this room. Hallelujah. And I think in that crowd, there may be those who actually, for the first time, are accepting the atonement Jesus provides. If this morning was the first time you really ever heard that forgiveness only comes through Jesus, maybe you thought you could earn it. Maybe you thought you lived a good enough life that God would kind of credit you with something. Maybe you had different ideas about how, you know, you get forgiveness from God. But for the first time, you realize, oh, it's through Jesus who died for me in my place. And by believing in Jesus, that's how I'm forgiven. And my answer to you is unequivocally yes. There's no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved other than Jesus. And this morning you're like, then that's what I want to do. I want to believe in the name of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and ask Him to save me. Then right there where you're seated, even amongst all these believers who right now are growing in their appreciation, if you would like to accept the gift of the atonement, just say something like this to God. God, I can't cross this chasm of my sin. But now I know that Jesus has when he died on the cross. So I put all of my trust and hope and faith in Jesus' work for me. He's your son, my savior. I'm asking you, God, to save me through Jesus. And in this second man, God will do exactly that. He will save you from your sins. He'll give you this gift of salvation provided through the atonement of Christ. And you'll no longer be at a great distance. You'll no longer be out. You'll no longer be guilty. You'll be innocent. You'll be close. You'll be in. You'll be family. All because of Jesus.